Next on Garden Line, planting bulbs in the fall. And I've dug it about 10 to 12 inches deep because I want to loosen up this bottom soil here so it has good draining. And the Arboretum at McCrory Gardens in Brookings. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications. Welcome to Garden Line. I'm Stephen Monk. Tonight on our show, fall is a good time to plant bulbs in the garden. An extension horticulturalist, Rhoda Burroughs, will teach us how to plant and fertilize several different bulb plants. Also, Garden Line visits the South Dakota State Arboretum located in Brookings, South Dakota, to see if there are any fall colors starting to show. And as always, our panel of lawn and garden experts will answer your questions, so get ready to call in. Our panelists are here with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, insects, trees, and a host of other lawn and garden concerns. Joining me in the studio to answer your questions are John Keycaper, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, SDSU Horticulture Department Head and Extension Horticulturalist, Larry Osborne, Extension Plant Pathologist, and Dennis Toddy, our Extension Climatologist. You can start calling now. The phone number for you to call with your lawn and garden questions is 1-866-595-SDSU. Again, that is 1-866-595-7378. Helping to answer the phones tonight are the folks from the Lots Greenhouse near Ward, South Dakota. And remember, when you call in with your questions, Please provide our phone volunteers with as much information as possible about your garden problem. Be ready to provide a description of the problem, when the problem first appeared, whether it's affecting any other surrounding plants, and moisture or and soil conditions that may exist around the problem. Now, before we get to your questions, Garden Line went on location with extension horticulturalist Rhoda Burrells. Rhoda demonstrates about how to plant different varieties of ball plants and the proper usage of fertilizer. Here's Rhoda with the details. Good afternoon, this is Rhoda Burroughs, Horticulture Extension Specialist at SDSU. Today I wanted to show you a few things about planting bulbs. And what I have in my hand here, I just dug out of my garden. These are grape hyacinth or muscari. They're many different species of these, although we usually see the one that looks like little little purple flowers. You may start to see these coming up right now in your backyard. Don't worry about it. It's natural for them. They'll die down and fall. It doesn't mean there's a problem with them. If you look at these, they spread quite well in the garden by themselves. Over the years, they'll, they'll spread. And you can dig them up if you want and, and rearrange them to different areas if you want. I'd like to show you now some, some bulbs. And these are just some bulbs that I got locally uh, they're not necessarily the best quality bulbs and I'll show you why you see the size variation there the smaller bulb is likely not to uh, be able to flower this coming spring if you plant it though it'll continue growing and probably probably go ahead and flower the following year these are daffodils and so we want to plant them about six to eight inches deep I've dug a hole here, and I've dug it about 10 to 12 inches deep because I want to loosen up this bottom soil here so it has good drainage. And then I'm going to put in a little bit of bulb food. And for bulb food, you want something with a fairly balanced nutrient. So this is 996. Uh, people often use uh, bone meal, but bone meal is very high in phosphorus without much nitrogen. And most of our South Dakota soils, you're going to need some nitrogen, maybe phosphorus, maybe not. So 
sprinkle in a little bit of fertilizer, and then I'm going to cover that. Work it in well. That's where the roots are, so that's where we want the fertilizer. And then I want to go eight inches deep, which is about here in the planter. So fill that in a little bit. Now roots down. And the eight inches is the bottom of the bulb, not the top. So you want those six or eight inches apart and then go ahead and you can fill in on top of that. It's a good idea when you've filled in part way to go ahead and water it in to eliminate any air holes. And then go ahead and fill in the rest of the way. Now if you want, you can mix in some smaller bulbs that don't get planted as deep. These are crocus. So I'm just going to put those in and that's the bottom of the bulb. And we'll go ahead and fill that in. And that's about all there is to it. If you want, you can mulch over the top. Uh, if you've got heavy clay, what you might want to do is build this up some so that it drains well. So you might want to go only six inches deep and put a couple inches up over the surface of the, of the ground. That's it for today. All right. Well, we want to thank Rhoda for that information because this is the time of year when those ball plants will be uh, going in. So, But before we get to our questions that are coming in, we do our topic of the week yeah, with our specialist here. So, John, what do you have for us in the insect world? Well, we're getting pretty well through the season for insects, in the garden anyway. We have some moving into houses and things, but in the garden we're at a point now when most of the things are pretty well done. You're not really going to need to do much anymore at this time of year for garden pests. And so I brought in a, a picture of something that gets a lot of attention at this time of year. I brought in a picture of a woolly bear. These are the caterpillars that you see crawling around pretty good numbers at this time of year. You'll even see them crossing roads and things. Um, they get into houses a little bit in some settings, not very often, but they'll be up around houses sometimes, under boards, under things sitting on the ground. And they're just moving around looking for a place to overwinter. They overwinter as caterpillars and then they pupate the next spring. But these get some attention at this time of year because people will say that you can tell how bad the winter is going to be based on the size of that band. And uh, we got Dennis here tonight, he'll be able to maybe address that too. But in my experience, that's not really the case. Uh, if it works, I think it's more chance than anything. Um, I have a hard time telling, honestly, if those bands are wider or shorter in one year as compared to another year. And really, the size of those bands is dependent on the stage of the caterpillar and not so much on the weather or what the weather will be in the future. But a uh, good topic of discussion, I think, for a lot of people to discuss the length of those and how it might uh, be an indicator of what the winter is going to be like. Okay. Are they a concern for any plants or issues as far as damage or more of a nuisance? Or? Well, not really much any of the above. They tend to feed on grasses as caterpillars. Um, they're not really much of a, a pest, although I suppose if you're growing some ornamental grasses and you had quite a few of them come in there, it may be concern in some of those, but otherwise they're out in the grasses and then they turn into a moth, uh, kind of a tiger stripe moth, and not much else to them. They okay. don't do any other damage. Okay. Thanks, John. David, what do you have for us this week? Well, I was hoping to have some pictures of what our new Education and Visitor Center is going to be looking like out at McCrory Gardens. We're getting very close to putting out the bids for this new structure. It's going to be about a 9,400 square foot building, about a $4 million project. So we're real excited about all the work that we've been doing on that. Uh, so watch what's happening out at McCrory Gardens over on the east side of the uh, property there. Uh, we've got the area cleared out where the new building is going to go, but it's going to have a, a large meeting area, kind of a great hall area, along with a couple smaller conference rooms, lecture hall kind of spaces. So it's going to be a really unique facility for the gardens, uh, for the university, and really for the whole region. It'll be available for uh, use for academic programs, for educational sessions. We're going to get the master gardeners busy out there and help us with some programming and so forth out there. So it's going to be a really exciting new asset to McCroy Gardens and to, whole, to the whole area. So watch for that. I don't know if we'll get groundbreaking yet this fall. We're hoping to, but uh, it's going to be constructed pretty much over the course of the next year or so. And along with that, uh, this week we have a team from a uh, arch landscape architecture firm out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that's helping us with a master planning process for the whole gardens and the arboretum. So they're coming back tomorrow 
uh, to kind of unveil what they think we should be doing as far as a master plan for the whole garden. So that's going to be very exciting uh, to see how that's going to tie in with the new visitor center and uh, how the gardens are going to evolve hopefully over the next 10 to 20 years or so. It's going to be a long-term process, but uh, we're going to have it broken down into different phases and how we're going to be uh, kind of renovating the whole gardens essentially and putting in uh, kind of new themes and different areas, working with uh, native plants all the way up to cultivated plants of today. So it's a lot of exciting things going on at McCroy Gardens these days. Good. That's an exciting, uh, great uh, addition to the, the gardens that we'll be looking it's forward really to. really neat. So. Larry, I want to thank you for bringing our table setting uh, well, decoration today. Well, it's fall. So, we should yeah. have some nice colors on the, uh, the fall table here. We get a few questions on Garden Line about mushrooms and, and the edibility and so forth. Uh, we had a nice set of photos sent in by a viewer uh, from a place, and I pride myself in knowing where all these places are in South Dakota, but West Jasper. I don't know where West Jasper, South Dakota is at. But we got this, uh, apparently it's in Moody County. Is that opposed to East Jasper? <laughs> As opposed to East Jasper, across the river, I think. Okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, we had some nice photos come in uh, of a sulfur shelf mushroom. Now, uh, and Dave pointed this out to me, these are uh, uh, part of what we call the foolproof four, or what mushroom hunters will call the foolproof four. Uh, there's uh, about four mushrooms that uh, are very difficult to misidentify. Uh, and this is one of those. This is Litoporus sulfurous or a sulfur shelf mushroom and it's called that because of the the color the sulfur color uh, there's another picture this was sent in by a viewer beautiful picture on the side of I believe an ash tree there uh, and this is very common in the fall good time of year to see these kinds of these polypore mushrooms uh, we have other other kinds of polypores that come out at this time of year uh, another one that's going to be common right now is hen of the woods the common name of this sulfur shelf is chicken of the woods, and you see uh, it, it does have some resemblance to the, the feathers of a chicken. Uh, it also, believe it or not, is supposed to taste like chicken. Uh, we say that about a lot of things. Uh, but this one, it is an edible mushroom, and uh, mushroom hunters would call this choice edible. Uh, but, but be careful, just as with any uh, mushroom, identification is number one. Number two, uh, Individuals have sensitivities to the different chemicals that can be found in these different fungi. Some people are allergic to the, the sulfur shelf mushroom, and so be very careful if you decide to go uh, and, uh, find these mushrooms and do some, uh, some cooking with that. This particular mushroom needs to be cooked for about 45 minutes or an hour uh, in order to make it tender and to detoxify some of the, the compounds in there. Otherwise, it can kind of give you an upset tummy from what I understand. But a lot of uh, mushroom mushroomers will uh, talk about cutting off the uh, the youngest growth here. These these grow very rapidly during the day, and that tender that tender outer growth resembles a, a cut chicken breast. So saute or boil or or put that in a stew or a soup, and for about 45 minutes or an hour, and takes up a lot of the flavor of the broth and gives it a nice texture. So chicken of the woods, uh, another again related species would be hen of the woods, which is going to look a little different but fall mushrooms that are out there and uh, again be very careful with what you put in your in your food but this is one of the ones that uh, most people can tolerate so when you were talking about as far as cooking that in the water pulling out some of the toxins you, you discard the water then i would assume or? it actually it, uh, <coughs> from what i understand they're not so much toxins as they are maybe some irritants to the okay. to the human stomach and and it actually changes the chemistry i think they're they're okay once they're cooked um, so again it's uh, Okay in soups, okay to cook okay. these in a soup. So, so you don't on. have to add mushroom soup to this. That's right. Okay. Now you have mushroom chicken soup all in one. All right. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Dennis, good to have you back on the show tonight. Great so, to be here. Yeah. <laughs> what do you have us from the well, nothing, climactical no, standpoint? Nothing as cool as cooking mushrooms. I know. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Now we get, Larry said it's fall. I have, to, I have to disagree with you partially. Oh, excuse me. Fall doesn't start officially till tomorrow unless you're talking about climatological fall. Climatological fall starts about the 1st of September when conditions that are, that are fall uh, set in over the state on average. And uh, so we start talking about frost freeze. And uh, we've got a graphic here reminding us when these frost freeze dates. These are the, the, about the average date of frost freeze across the state. 
You see it ranges from some locations, the average date being uh, first part of, of, uh, of September or the Black Hills, you know, we kind of leave that out altogether, to about the second week of, you know, second week of, or excuse me, about the second to third week of September over most of the state and then towards the end of the month as we get into the southern parts of the state and a few of the places that are along the Missouri River where the river helps to protect them somewhat. Now, again, this is an average date. That means about half the time it's before this, about half the time it's after this. So, you know, Within you know within about five to seven days either side this date covers most of the occasions when we when we see frost freeze so you know right now we're in the middle of that uh, by this point so you know we are susceptible at this point you know looking at some of the outlooks we've had a couple locations that have, have seen some sub freezing conditions but they have been very isolated to the southwestern part of the state one up in the northeast um, but overall you know we don't see any conditions necessarily that say we're going to be having a frost or freeze coming up anytime soon. And these are averages? These are averages. So yes. half the time they're earlier and half the time they're later than right, these dates. Right. Okay. And this is over the, a 30 year period from 74 to 2003. We've got to update those and, and get these, the most recent data up there too. Okay. Now, today I saw an email come out from you that indicated that Brookings set a record. Yes, it did. Uh, we have set a record for the, high, the highest annual total precipitation. So even though we're in the middle of September, we have set our record, uh, defeating a record we set back in 2005 for the most precipitation for a year, even with the three months left to go. Uh, Wessington Springs has set a record for theirs already. We have a few other stations around the state that are within, within, well within capability of setting annual records also. Um, Sioux Falls, uh, Huron, and Dupree uh, and the northwestern part of the state all you know, are within a few inches of being able to set a record for their locations. Okay, good. Say, so, uh, quick question, I was, I was thinking as far as the, um, the frost, free, er, frost freeze dates. Yes. Is there any kind of trend associated with them changing oh, over the years? Or? Very definitely, Is very it? definitely. A uh, very consistent trend over most of the state towards overall longer growing seasons. Uh, I think we've got a graphic uh, to show on this for the, for the fall uh, that where we're seeing, here, here's our first fall, the, and the, what we're showing here is, is for Miller, just as an example, it's a good example from across the state, uh, going from 1900 through the early 2000s, and these are the, the day of the year uh, of when that first fall frost, or the first time it went below 32 in the fall. So day 270 there, that would be about October 1st, or just before October 1st. So and we put a trend line on there. You can see there's a lot of scatter, but you can see there's very definitely a trend over the last 100 years uh, to about oh, 10 to 12 days earlier. So we have a very distinct trend towards a, a later first fall freeze. And then we also have a consequent uh, spring, spring situation that shows very much the same thing where you're seeing uh, the last spring frost uh, is getting much earlier. You know, see uh, the same kind of trend, a lot of scatter, but again, we've dropped about, in this case, about 20 days, about 20 days earlier from the first, from the turn of the 19th century to the turn of the 20th century, uh, where, uh, the, where we're getting uh, the, the first freeze is coming uh, later, later or, or earlier in the spring. So we're getting an overall longer growing season. Again, a lot of variability, but an overall longer growing season we're adding on both ends of it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Larry, West Jasper is about 10 miles south of Pipestone in Minnesota. Well, okay. So All right. We got that, that solved where that's located. So. We're in the, we're in the so right no wonder now. we didn't know it was in Minnesota. Yeah. Minnesota. <laughs> Minnesota. Even though it was only 30 miles away yeah. from it. All right. So. Well, let's get started on our questions uh, for tonight. Uh, this comes from Rapid City. And Dave and, and Dennis, if you want to chime in as well. Uh, watering, does it help to water plants morning or evening to keep them from freezing? And will this protect them from light frost? Well, I'd say in general, a well-watered plant is going to be able to tolerate stress of all kinds. Uh, if you've got a plant that's under water stress, it's going to tend to get more damage on it probably to frost. So I'd say if you uh, can keep your plants well-watered, keep them turgid, that's going to help. Uh, but there is some People that will say, well, if you have less water, the, the, the contents of the cells is going to be more highly concentrated, a little bit more salty, and that's going to give some protection there too. But I think in general, for the most part, uh, if your plants are not being stressed from other things like water stress, they're going to be healthier and going to be able to withstand other things that might come along like a frost. Okay. 
I guess I, so what, I, what I throw on is, you know, what what my, what my people might be thinking of is they do water yes. fruit trees in in the south when there are freeze conditions, but these are ones where they spray water over the whole tree, because the water then forms an insulating barrier around that and protects the fruit from you know even a couple degrees protects it from freezing. I don't know if additional watering will help a great deal because if you have more moisture around the area, that does. You know, when we have the very moist conditions during the summertime, that keeps us, our temperatures from dropping at night. But just watering around one plant or tree, I'm not sure if that would change the microclimate enough to really, to really make much of a difference. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, this also comes from Rapid City, David. Uh, a yucca. Viewer has purchased some yucca plants. Is this the time of the year to plant them? And what type of soil would be best for these plants? Well, yucca is a, a native plant here in South Dakota. Uh, primarily the white yucca, yucca glauca. Uh, they need a typically a well-drained site. If you have a, a little bit of a raised bed or something, that would be a good site for them. But we'll see them growing out West River in a lot of areas uh, around the state, even in some of the clay soils out there. But uh, they don't need a lot of extra moisture. They tend to develop a very deep root system. Uh, so I'd say the earlier you can get them planted, the better, so they get a chance to start getting some roots get developed this fall before the ground freezes. I would not try to keep them in a pot. And really for any plants that you might have, uh, that you're thinking about planting this fall. You know, in general, now is a pretty good time to get those plants in the ground. We say fall is for planting, nursery stock in general. Uh, and again, if you can get things in the ground earlier, that gives the, those roots a chance to get established in the soil before the ground gets too cold. You can get a lot of active root growth this fall, and they'll be able to survive the winter much better that way. Okay. We're going to keep you in the hot seat here, Dave. Uh, asparagus. And we have two questions related to asparagus, one from Groton and one from Arlington. When is a good time to plant asparagus, spring or fall? Um, and the other question is, would like to start asparagus from seed and would like some pointers on how to do that? So. In general, we suggest planting asparagus in the spring. Uh, if you, and it's best to buy uh, one-year-old seedling plants from a nursery garden center, get them online or from a mail order catalog. And you're gonna to wanna to plant those crowns down about, oh, 8 to 12 inches deep or so in the soil. You can plant a little bit deeper in some cases if you have a, a, a sandier type soil. But get them planted down. We essentially dig a trench, get them get spread out the roots of that crown down in the base, fill it up with about 2 or 3 inches of soil, wait until the plants start to grow, and then gradually fill that trench in. So you're going to have that root system down about 10 to 12 inches or so, and then the shoots are going to come up out of the ground. Uh, that's the best way to get the plants started. Plants planting in the fall, probably not a real Great practice if you say you had some plants and you wanted to transplant them, you could do that. But again, like we've talked about earlier in the show, like transplanting strawberries, you're better off buying good, healthy, disease-free plants from a local nursery or garden center. If you want to start them yourself, uh, I would you can purchase the seed from a for a variety of uh, asparagus plants. Uh, I'd just plant them in an area in your garden where you can kind of have them separated out. You just plant them in a row like you would some of your other vegetables. And then after the first year, you, would, you could then transplant them or divide them, spread them out. You want to plant them probably about a foot apart or so uh, once you get that trench dug, as I described earlier. But it's really very easy to just buy the, the plants as one-year-old crowns and put those in the spring. Okay, thank you. Well, as we do other weeks, we have some questions and graphics that come into us uh, during the week. And the first one we have tonight is graphic number one. And this is from Leeds, South Dakota. Uh, they have a very old, very big lilac bush and, that they love, but this year the leaves look something like something's been chewing on them all around the edges. Also, there are some gray, dusty splotches on the leaves. Uh, are the bite marks or gray spots related? I cannot find any worms or insects that are chewing. I realize it's late in the year. Do we do anything? The leaves will be falling for winter very soon. But should I do something for next year as a preventative measure? Who wants to start, Larry or <laughs> start John? With, or Start with me, huh? Okay, let's start okay. with John. Uh, well, the uh, marks around the outside of the leaf certainly look to me like they could be feeding damage from an insect or several insects. Um, determining which one it is without finding something there is pretty difficult in a case like this because there are any number of insects that will be generalist feeders that will come along and just take some notches out of the edge of a leaf that way. Uh, you know, some that I might suspect on, on a plant like this could even be grasshopper or cricket damage. 
uh, earwigs get in on some of those as well. There are any number of insects that, that'll notch the edges of leaves that way. In terms of real damage to those, those uh, shrubs or those leaves, in this case, I don't think that you're going to have enough damage on that leaf to actually warrant doing anything at all for it, and especially at this time in the season, I think you just let it be for this year, and, and uh, hopefully next year you don't have some of those things feeding on it, but I don't think it's going to do any real harm to the shrub. In relation to the spots, I'm going to turn that over to Larry. I don't think it has anything at all to do with the insect no, feeding. No, I don't think it. so either. I think this is a common problem with lilacs uh, and a lot of other ornamental plants in our garden. Powdery mildew is what this looks like to me, and it looks like the fall stage. Uh, those start to turn a little more gray in color. The mycelium, which is the fungal body, starts to die down. And uh, if you look up close at some of those uh, specks, you might find little black uh, bodies in there, and that's the, the spore uh, forming body that uh, powdery mildew can have. Um, could be a few other fungi, surface fungi as well, but I think probably powdery mildew. Um, nothing to worry about with lilacs. Uh, if you can open up that area a little bit, maybe do a little selective pruning on that lilac to improve the airflow. Uh, but again, very susceptible all, uh, all over the state. We're going to have problems in a wet year like this with a little bit more powdery mildew. Well, I was going to say, typically more on the eastern side of the state, that's a fairly common symptom that we see. So would this indicate, uh, and it's an older planting, and it seems fairly new that they've noticed this or recently that that would indicate maybe the moisture conditions have been a little bit higher in the lead right, area this right. year. Or? I guess their microclimate's changed a little bit and maybe they're getting a little more than average, but I think in general lilacs being so susceptible to that fungus. Um, and really it's not a major problem on any plant unless it's, it's covering those leaves and preventing them from getting their good sunlight. Uh, we have a good home remedy that we recommend. It's on our Garden Line website. And it's a uh, half to a tablespoon of baking powder, excuse me, baking soda uh, with a teaspoon of uh, vegetable oil per gallon of water. Spray that about every five to ten days throughout the, the, uh, the damp parts of the year and it does a really good job of changing that surface chemistry and preventing that surface uh, fungal growth. Okay, yeah, Dennis? We, we certainly have, you know, we, they've, the Black Hills have dried out a little bit as the summer has gone on, but uh, you know, wet early, wet last year, wet couple of years in a row here, two, three years in a row. So certainly the moisture conditions have been conducive, uh, you know, very wet, conducive to, to producing something like that. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, gentlemen. We also have another one that came in, and this comes to us from Brookings. Attached should be a photo of a Japanese red maple, and I believe it is, uh, the photo that we have. I planted it in their, my front yard. I sent a photo that was viewed on an earlier garden line. Since then I have trimmed out the dead branches, staked it, and it has grown about eight inches. Now, however, there are spots on most of the leaves, and three of the leaves have curled up as if they're preparing for fall leaf drop. Are these leaves, are the spots and the curled leaves something I should worry about? Uh, he indicates here that John Ball, right, uh, is John Ball right in suggesting that these, this tree will never survive and I should give up and exercise my warranty before the 12 months are up. So, well, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to make a quick comment, that, Larry? quick comment on the picture, and I'm going to turn it over to David. I think he'll have a lot more to say. Uh, the picture, to me, it's a very unusual symptom for, for pathogens. However, I think in this case it could be anthracnose, very common leaf disease in maple trees, and one capable of producing those irregular lesions like that. And at this time of year, those would start to crack and maybe drop out of the leaf like we see in that picture. So uh, anthracnose is not usually a problem uh, uh, long term for that tree. It's going to likely get some of that every year. And the older and the healthier it gets, the better off it will be. Now, as to Japanese maple in general, I'll turn that over to David. Well, I have to agree with John. Uh, Japanese maples are really iffy uh, in most of South Dakota. Now, if you're in a protected spot, say Sioux Falls or in the southeast corner of the state, you might get one to survive for a few years. But in general, I'd say we're probably going to have to be looking at replacing that plant. Now, I've got one that I've had now for about three years at my house, but I have it in a pot and I set it out on the, on the sidewalk during the summer and I put it in the garage over the wintertime. So you might want to consider that if you really like Japanese maples, and I, I think they're great looking plants. Uh, you could try that. Uh, try to find one of the smaller growing cultivars that are adapted to growing in a container. Uh, if you can find a really well protected spot, you might get by. You could even 
consider putting a, like a chicken wire fence around it and just fill it up with leaves in the fall of the year. Try to give it as much protection as you can. You might get it to survive for a few years, but they're really iffy for this part of the, of the world. All right. Uh, Dave, iris, when is the best time to divide iris? And this is from Aberdeen. Well, the ideal time to divide iris is probably July into early August. Uh, after they're done flowering, essentially, they go through kind of an active growth period. And uh, you can divide the, the uh, rhizomes at that time. Generally, you take kind of the, the newest part of those rhizomes and replant them uh, in the ground. Make sure you plant them fairly shallow. If we're talking about the typical bearded iris, uh, they need to be planted fairly shallowly with the top of that rhizome right at the soil surface. There are lots of other kinds of iris, however. Uh, the uh, Siberian iris, for example, and even the, the bearded iris, they're all pretty tough plants. You can still divide those if you have some plants that you want to try to get divided yet this fall, but I would try to do it fairly soon. Uh, plant them at about the same depth that they were growing before. If you're doing it later in the year, again, some mulch around those plants for the fall might be a good idea to give them some extra protection. Okay. Uh, this comes from Sioux Falls, and it says, wondering if you, and I'm going to say you is going to be referring to Dennis here in this case, have a prediction as far as winter temperatures and precipitation, we will be above or below normal this year. As far as the farmer's almanac goes, is that usually pretty accurate compared to what happens? Uh, let's see, we've gone to woolly bears, we've gone to farmer's almanac. <laughs> um, what do we have left? Um, I'll say no, it's not. Um, they, there was another climatologist who, who said they did a study on it one time and actually had a negative skill. Uh, so it had it had actually would, would more often than not went the opposite way. The other thing about the farmer's almanac, it tends to be very general in nature, so there's nothing very specific about it, so you can say whether they were right or wrong very well. What we're looking at for this winter is last year we were in El Nino. Not, last year was not a very well-behaved El Nino. We're going to the opposite phase now called La Nina. And what that means, this is for Sioux Falls, the southeast part of the state is kind of in a transition area. Temperature-wise, we might be a little on the, on, on the cool side, slightly, slightly cooler than average over most of the winter. Um, as you get further north and west in the state, the chances for a little bit cooler than average winter are, are stronger uh, because that, that is the way La Niñas tend to go. Uh, there is a decent signal in the eastern part of the state that we uh, stay a little drier during La Niñas, especially that late winter time period when, uh, when we have our bigger storms, uh, maybe a little less frequent there, so a little less chance for precipitation. As you get to the central and western part of the state, that signal is not as strong. So for Sioux Falls, I, I, I would tend to say near to maybe slightly below average temperatures and maybe o probably overall less precipitation, I, I would think, uh, out, of, out of this winter is what we're kind of looking for. Okay. Does either case or scenario really vary as far as wind velocities during the winter? Uh, no, the wind's going to blow in the winter no matter what. <laughs> we, we've been talking about this because of you know, what might happen with the soil conditions. Uh, because last year we had an interesting situation where we got enough soil on the ground early, or excuse me, enough snow on the ground early that the soil froze, but just barely. And all the reports I heard last year was the soil was marginally frozen. And with the wet soils that we have, that's a, that may be a good thing to allow them to, to, uh, to drain some more, and a little more moisture to percolate. If we don't have that snow cover, the soils are gonna freeze harder and deeper. And if we don't get that snow cover, we'll have to make sure that we do more about covering sensitive plants because they won't have that, uh, that coverage capability from, from the snowfall. Okay, thank you, Dennis. We'll see how accurate that is <laughs> next spring. Okay, we'll come back. Well, yesterday, Garden Line returned to Macquarie Gardens in Brookings, South Dakota to check out the Arboretum, the 45-acre area north of the formal gardens that was most of, which most of us are familiar with was dedicated for the planting and testing of ornamental trees and shrubs in 1982. Six years later, in 1988, the site was designated as the South Dakota State Arboretum. As fall is nearly upon us, here is a glimpse at the start of the fall colors seen in the McCrory Arboretum.
All right. Well, we really want to thank our camera individual for bringing us some nice fall scenes from Macquarie Gardens here. So thank you very much for that. Before we went to Macquarie Gardens, we were talking about some trends. Yes. And we've got another one we'd like to have you talk about, Dennis. Okay. Uh, and that is the fall precipitation trend. Oh, yeah. And I believe you got a graphic for oh, that, yeah. too, that we can uh, look at. Something that's captured a lot of interest recently because of the the additional fall precipitation in a, in a harvest issue uh, and then carry over into the springtime. I think, yeah, we've got the graphic right here showing the, a trend of what is happening in the way of fall precipitation over the last hundred years. And there's a very impressive trend that we have seen. Here we go. Uh, from the, you know, from the late 1890s, you can see this is fall and what we're considering fall is September, October, November. And this is for the northeastern part of South Dakota, not just one station, but a bunch of different stations. So you can see there's a lot of variability, you know, some lower times in the 30s and the 50s. But you can see a pretty marked increase. And, and the line here is a 10-year running average. So it's an average of the 10 years previous to that. So since about 1980, about the last 30 years, you see a big increase, you know, from just below four inches to almost six inches. So, you know, that's that's about a 33% increase in average fall precipitation over that time period. And then those spikes, you can see some very, very heavy fall precipitation events. That doesn't include 2009 in it. So it's, it's uh, one that is, I mean, it's giving is plenty of soil moisture recharge. That's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing from a harvest perspective, carryover of moisture into the spring, and having excessively wet soils in the spring, too. Okay. Thank you. No problem. All right. Dave, geraniums. They would like to know if they can be overwintered, and if so, what would be some ways to do that? Well, probably the best way for most people to overwinter geraniums is if you've got a big enough windowsill, you can just dig some of the plants out get most of that garden soil off the roots and pot them up in some good potting soil. If you don't have as big enough windowsills, uh, you can take some cuttings, probably about two to three inch long cuttings from the tips of the stems. You can root those in a commercial rooting media like uh, you know, some of the <coughs> based uh, vermiculite based or perlite based materials that are out there. Uh, keep them wet. You can put them actually in a pot with some like a plastic bag over the top. Those should root in probably two or three weeks or so and you'll have some nice little plants that you can overwinter. And of course, there's the old uh, method that a lot of people still try to use, where you take the plant out of the ground, get most of the soil off the roots, put it in a, a paper grocery sack, cut some holes in that grocery sack to give it a little ventilation, and hang it up in your basement. Now, that used to work really well when people had old, unfinished basements, and that basement temperature was down around 55 to 60 degrees or so. Now, most people have finished basements. They're, you know, 70 degrees. A little bit too warm to try to do that. If you've got a cool area, kind of a, maybe a, a, an area that's in your basement that stays cooler, you might be able to try that. But I'd encourage you, probably the best thing to do is just to visit your local garden center or nursery in the spring and buy some fresh new plants. That's probably the best way to try to do it. But uh, try some cuttings, or if you've got a few plants that you really enjoyed, uh, put them in, you know, pot them up in some soil. They need a pretty sunny location in your house in order to be able to grow well and bloom during the summer or during the winter time. But uh, they can add some color to that windowsill during the winter. All right. And that was from Sioux Falls, but it really wouldn't make any difference where you're at in the state for that process right. or procedure. Where does humidity enter in here if they do want to try to overwinter those? Well, that's the issue. Uh, if you try to do the, the grocery sack uh, technique, uh, if your basement gets really, if it's in a really dry area, they're going to tend to get really desiccated by spring. Uh, generally, by about probably the first of March or so, you need to take those out of that grocery sack, probably cut them back, pot them up, and then you're going to have to kind of get them to restart growing again. And so take them a while because you're going to probably have some real etiolated yellowish tissue that might have grown on those plants during the winter months. Uh, cut that back so you can encourage some fresh new growth on the plants. It's something that's kind of fun to try, but uh, if you've got plants that you really want to try to overwinter, it's best to probably just take some cuttings of those. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> coming back to you again, Dave. Tomatoes from Newell. The tomatoes, the fruit, are not finishing as far as ripening. They turn pink, but not red. They put some in a paper bag for 10 days, and they still did not ripen. Well, I would guess that it's maybe that variety of tomato. There are pink varieties of tomatoes. There are red varieties of tomatoes, orange, yellow, white, green, striped, almost black. There's all huge, huge variety of tomatoes that are out there. So I'm guessing that might be the particular variety that they have. If they seem like they kind of soften up and get to be a good texture for fresh eating and have good flavor, I wouldn't worry that they aren't changing color necessarily. but uh, you know, putting them, putting them in a paper sack or laying them on a, uh, in a box and put a layer of newspaper over the top to help 
to get that ethylene gas that's put out by the tomatoes to cause ripening. That's another thing that they can try, but um, I think it's probably variety related in this case. But they don't need the sun to have them turn right. No, you don't. Yep. No, but it's better if they, they're going to probably have a little <laughs> bit better flavor if they ripen on the plant. But that's the thing that you can do when the frost does start getting predictions. Mm -hmm. You can pick those green tomatoes. You can use green tomatoes for cooking. Uh, but if you got some that seem like they're pretty firm and pretty much full size, but they just haven't ripened up yet, you know, put them out on a box, put a layer of paper towel over the top, uh, or a layer of newspaper over the top, and they will uh, continue to mature and ripen that way too. Okay, good. From here on, uh, John, viewer has one inch long skinny brownish black worms in the cement and on the cement around their garage. They're really thin, and they've never had them in the past, at least where they observed them to this number. What could they be and what could be done? Here they say to get rid of them. But okay. Yeah. Uh, do we know if they have legs or not? They do not indicate that. Okay. But okay. I think you probably know what they are. Well, we got two things that I'm kind of thinking, and they're one or the other, I think, right now. We see both of them pretty commonly. <laughs> slugs are one, and slugs would not have legs. They're going to kind of slime their way across things is the best way to put it <laughs> yeah. that I know of. These are really thin. Really thin. Well, yep. slugs will stretch out okay. quite a bit. Right. So they, they could be slugs. Uh, they will kind of contract and, and shrink up a little bit, get fatter if you disturb them, and that would be an indication of slugs. The other one that we see pretty commonly in buildings, on buildings, around buildings at this time of year are millipedes. And I've had a lot of calls about millipedes within the last few days. These actually have a lot of legs. If you look at them, the legs stick down underneath the body segments. If they come out the sides, they're probably centipedes. But if they're below the body segments, they're probably millipedes. Most millipedes have two pairs of legs per body segment. And they get into buildings, around buildings, pretty commonly when we have these moist conditions, especially really humid days in the fall. Not sure what makes them do that, but they seem to come indoors under those conditions. When that happens, what I usually recommend for them is just sweep them up and throw them out. Uh, you can put down insecticides and, and kill some of them, but if you do that, you end up sweeping up the dead ones and throwing them out. So you can save the money on it, just sweep them up and throw them out. Uh, with slugs, if you're having huge numbers of slugs right now, it might be something that you want to try putting out some bait stations or something to catch some of them so you don't have as many next summer in those gardens. Okay. And the millipedes, those legs are really tiny, aren't they? On most of the millipedes, the legs are really tiny. You're not going to notice them much. You might see them kind of waving underneath there as they walk. Okay. Aren't those the ones if you touch them, they curl up in a curly cue? Yeah. Or yep, most of them will kind of spiral concentric. up into yeah, a little spiral, that's what coil of yeah. rope or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Kind of crunchy if you step on them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dave, uh, when is the best time to plant rhubarb? And this is Morris, Iowa. Well, rhubarb is another one of those spring vegetables that are probably going to do best if we can transplant them in the spring, but it's also another tough uh, plant. Uh, if you've got a, a patch that you need to divide and move because of construction or what have you, you could still do it this fall, but in general it's probably better again to start with fresh new plants or divide established plants early in the spring. Uh, rhubarb starts growing when we just get some of that soil just starts to warm up and gets uh, where you can work the soil. That's probably a good time to think about transplanting the asparagus in the spring. All right. Well, we're going to go back to a couple uh, questions and graphics that came in over the week. And this one comes from Brookings, and this is graphics three and four. What causes peppers to get purple slash black coloration on parts of the fruit? It seems to be happening to the jalapeno, green, and banana peppers. This just started happening in September. Is the fruit still edible? Larry, Dave? Well, I'm guessing it's a production of some, some pigment in that fruit, uh, possibly anthocyanin uh, is going to give us that dark uh, coloration there. It generally, as far as I know, tends to be related to some cool temperatures that we might have experienced. Maybe a cool night here and there could have caused some of that uh, discoloration a little bit on the fruit. I don't think it's anything to be concerned about. As long as that fruit is nice and firm and doesn't feel like it's getting soft where those discolored areas are, I think it's probably going to be okay to eat. Okay. Yeah, that's, I, would, I agree completely with you, Dave. I think those are some natural colors for our, that family of plants. So it uh, just happen to be coming out in some odd places. Jalapenos especially will yeah. turn, the, the longer they are left on the, the vine, they'll turn very dark purple. So, so more environmental than a pathogen so. or anything? Right. Okay. I think so. 
All right. Uh, the next one is graphic number five, and this comes to us from Sioux Falls. And they have three endless summer hydrangeas that were planted together two to three years ago in partial shade. All have done very well in the past, and they've all received the same amount of water, sun, and fertilizer. Midsummer, one of them started dying off branch by branch. We have cut off all the dying branches, hoping to save it, but now it has now died off completely. The other hydrangeas next to it are healthy, and the other perennials and bushes in the area also look healthy. Do you have any idea what could have happened to our hydrangea, and what do you think it would be advisable to plant another hydrangea in the same location? I think we have a graphic. Uh, yep. Yeah, if we could see the graphic, that would. Yeah. I would just comment there are a couple, uh, okay. couple of common wilts uh, yeah. associated with hydrangea. Um, Bacterial wilt is probably very common this year, I would think. Uh, in, in the picture, though, it looked to me maybe a, a little bit more of a root problem as, as opposed to a pathogen issue. So, uh, you know, Dave, what's your thoughts? Well, I would agree. I think it's, it's more likely to be some kind of a root rot or crown rot that's happening down around the soil line. Uh, as far as replanting a, another hydrangea back in that exact same spot, I'd be a little cautious about doing that. Uh, there's probably going to be some of that tissue left behind in that soil that's going to potentially infest that new plant that you might put in the ground. Uh, and it might not either, but I think you might be better off if you could move to a slightly different location where you're going to have less chance of having that soil be contaminated by that fungus or bacteria, whichever it might be, that caused the death of that plant. I would like to, if they have the chance to, to submit a sample of this, there is the graphic of this particular plant, there are a couple of fungal problems, including one that's, that produces mushrooms, believe it or not, an armillaria root rot of, of hydrangea. I don't know how common it is in the north, uh, but uh, there are some distinct signs on the roots of those plants uh, if there are a fungal root rot uh, happening. So a sample into your extension office would be a good idea. Okay, good. Thank you, gentlemen. This comes from Madison, Dave. Maple tree has large roots coming above ground. The tree is 13 years old. Does this hurt the tree to have those roots at the surface like that? Well, it doesn't hurt the tree to have those roots at the surface unless you're mowing them with the lawnmower every week. That's going to be a problem. <laughs> uh, you know, that's where most people have concern. These roots are near the surface. They run the mower over it and they start scalping the top of those roots off. Uh, it's not very good for your lawnmower and it's not real great for the tree either. I suspect that perhaps the, the soil around that tree might be overly compacted and that's causing the roots to be closer to the surface where there's more oxygen available to them. Uh, roots need oxygen in order to survive. They are respiring tissue in those root systems. They need to have oxygen. So uh, maple especially with tend to see sometimes some fairly shallow roots developing. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. What I discourage you from is saying, well, gee, we're going to get a dump truck load of soil and bury them six inches deep in soil. Uh, that's going to be probably pretty detrimental to your tree. A better option might be to suggest that you just use uh, like an organic mulch, like a wood chip mulch or a hardwood uh, shredded bark mulch. Just put that down over that area, three, two, three, four inches thick or so. That's going to uh, cover up the roots so they aren't going to be visible to you. It's also going to eliminate having to mow in that area. And plus it's going to be healthy for the tree. It's going to keep the soil cooler, going to keep uh, down that competition with the grass and so forth, and it's going to keep the lawnmower away from banging into the tree and all those other kinds of things. So it's just something that we see with a, a, a number of different kinds of tree species occasionally. Not real serious problem for the tree itself, but when you start damaging the roots, that can be a problem. Okay. So the real problem could be the homeowner Ultimately, or, or that the caretaker the real of the problem. lawn. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right, this comes to us from Piedmont in Dennis or Dave. Uh, they live in a valley and it, where it's always cooler than Rapid City. He was wondering if for plant selection that he would be a zone cooler, say zone three, than zone four. He will usually freeze sooner than the other people around him. Is there well, any I, problem think, with I think they're on the right track, and in fact, the, one of the graphics that Dennis showed, he said you just kind of leave out the, the Black Hills area because you do have such variable microclimates there. Uh, as far as if it's really a, a zone different or not, it's kind of hard to say. I'd say that's probably a good guess. Uh, if you've got a, an area that tends to freeze earlier in the, in the fall and also tends to be later to get warmer in the spring, I don't know if that if it's going to have an effect on the low temperatures during the wintertime. That's based mostly what... Uh, the hardiness zones are based on is average low temperatures. 
So I don't know enough about the microclimate of that area, but maybe Dennis yeah. can give some other insight Pied there. Piedmont's probably not high enough where you'd see the, the, the different effect. Uh, yes, being down at the bottom of the valley, you're going to get cold air drainage, so you're probably going to freeze a little sooner than, than other places. You're not going to be as warm as Rapid City is, so you're going to have a bit of shorter growing season, not as high temperatures. The interesting thing is when you get higher in the Black Hills, you can actually get uh, have warmer temperatures in the wintertime because you're above the cold air that you can get out in the plains. Uh, so, so especially if you look at like temperatures from Custer, when it's especially cold in the wintertime, oftentimes Custer is warmer than Rapid City is because you're above that, that cold air which is very shallow. So yeah, I, I think you certainly want to you know, stay away from, from Rapid City type plants and, and move into something that's going to be a little hardier and, and a little more cold tolerant. Okay. They indicated here uh, cooler than say zone 3 or, or Four, would a zone two be? Well, a little. I'd say probably try with zone three plants. Yeah. Uh, okay. When you go from zone four to zone three, your your diversity of plants that you have to choose from drops dramatically, uh, just as it increases quite a bit from zone four to zone five. But I'd say try zone three plants. When you get to zone two plants, you know we're talking subarctic conditions just about there, and that, that <laughs> the list of plants that will survive in those areas is is very limited. And uh, in fact, a lot of those areas that are zone two have a lot of snow cover that helps to get a lot of plants through the winter. Dennis mentioned that earlier too. So I'm not sure what your snow cover typically is in that area. I would guess it's probably fairly good, but uh, that snow cover can have a huge influence. Okay. Dennis, a little bit ago, you talked to us about fall precipitation. Yep. Would you be willing to share with us uh, some summer precipitation trends? Oh, you bet, you bet. It's yeah. been it's been a great summer for precipitation on both ends of the scale. Uh, it has been a very interesting summer. Obviously, you know, we've talked to, alluded to some of the conditions already where we've had very very wet conditions. We've got a map here, our our, our, our bubblegum map, as they as they call it. What we're showing you here is is uh, this is percent of average precipitation. Uh, for uh, for a climatological summer, June 1st to August 31st. And the, the greens to purples are areas that are wetter than average, and you can see the two main areas there, uh, much of the southeastern quarter of the state, uh, uh, parts of the northwest and a little bit around the southern Black Hills. Uh, very, very wet conditions which we tracked uh, throughout most of the, of the summer. But there are a couple pockets that were not as well publicized. Uh, you can see in the north central area, Selby, Eureka, Bowdle area where we had much below average uh, precipitation. Uh, Selby in fact had its second driest summer on record. Only 600s off the, 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 the record. Uh, they had 3.07 inches for the summer. The record was 3.01. Amazing considering the amount of precipitation we had some other areas. Then there were some other areas in the southwest too, uh, kind of around the Martin area where there were, you know, they were wet early, dried out later, so they had a few problems that are kind of showing up now. So it was a very interesting summer of contrast, record, dro record dry and wet as, as we looked around the state. It was very, uh, a very interesting summer to be a part of. And then we have big hail too, just to throw in for fun. <laughs> All right. Okay, 15 seconds here, Dave. Can you tell me about the uh, pine beetle issue that John asked you to mention? Yep, there's going to be a workshop out in the Black Hills area coming up very soon. I think we got a graphic on that on the 25th. This is going to be a, a workshop out in the field. Come prepared to learn about the pine beetle and the devastating damage that they're doing and what we can do about it. All right, thank you. And that's all the time we have for this evening. So just to let you know, GuardLine does repeat twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting Digital Channel 3 which is also known as the Create Channel. The Encore broadcast can be seen Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Check your local listing to find SDPB Digital Channel 3. Now time to wrap up, and we want to thank our panel of experts, John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, Dave Graper, SDSU Horticulture Department Head and Extension Horticulturalist, Larry Osborne, Extension Plant Pathologist, and Dan Estati, Extension Climatologist. Thank you to our phone volunteers, the folks from IOTS Greenhouse near Ward, South Dakota. This is the last Garden Line show for the season, and we would like to thank you for watching and calling in. We have enjoy thoroughly enjoyed taking your questions, and have a good evening, and happy gardening.
This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications.